My great great grandfather knew every single tree in his maple syrup forest. He knew which trees were the most productive, which ones were the healthiest, and probably even which ones needed a little bit of help. Nowadays, I look at the same exact trees, but a little bit differently. My name is Ben Taylor, and I am from the State University of New York College of Environmental Science and Forestry, studying environmental resources engineering. My family makes maple syrup on 17,000 trees in Attica, New York. And today, I'd just like to take us through a journey in maple production. We'll explore how my family is pursuing the innovation, the cutting edge, the risky, and the challenging in maple syrup production, all while maintaining our understanding of the roots and where we came from. So first, let's imagine that we're walking in the woods. You're walking in the forest. There's trees all around, and you look up. What do you see? Leaves, probably, a full canopy of leaves. But what do those leaves tell you? Are the trees healthy? Are they productive? Where can we find more trees if we have to walk somewhere? Some certain measurements and observations that we can use can answer some of these questions for us, but I think that we can take it a step further with breaking into the world of remote sensing. Remote sensing is the analysis of images and data that we can gather from satellites or airplanes or drones or helicopters. And then by taking this data, we can analyze what possibly is going on in that image. So I think we can look at not just the red, green, and the blue of this data, but we can look at the near infrared that comes from these sensors. And what we'll be able to do is we'll be able to tell, is this section of woods healthy? Is that tree productive? Or what different spectral reflectance patterns correlate with a high sugar content tree? We can actually do that by looking at the different levels of, of chlorophyll in the leaves. The opportunities are there. Think about, maybe I could take a drone and just fly that over the maple forest and be able to tell, yeah, this section over here is the most productive. Or over here, we might need to go cut some trees next year so that the forest can be even healthier. It's time for us to take hold of that challenge, and I'm ready for it. One of the challenges that we've had in the maple industry is, is the question of when do you tap the trees in the spring, and when is the season going to end in March or April? My great-great-grandfather, my great-grandfather, and my great-uncle would, would tell me stories about, well, you just got to watch nature. You just have to look for some certain, certain things, like when the kill deer comes back after the winter, or when the first time you hear peepers in the spring, or how many times it rained last October. They, they've used these different things to, to be able to make predictions about how the weather will be in that springtime period, and possibly how much maple syrup that we're going to make that year. But I think we can take it a step further and be able to quantify how this is actually, the season is going to pan out. I think we can do this with the concept of growing degree days. So there's an article in the Maple News, which is a publication of the maple industry recently, that said that you can use a growing degree day number of 116 to be able to predict when the maple trees will bud. And when a maple tree buds, the flavor of the sap and therefore the flavor of the syrup changes, and that's when it's considered the season is over. So they said that this 116 number in growing degree days accumulate when the temperature is between 50 degrees Fahrenheit and 80 so what if we could predict when that number will hit 116 using localized temperature sensors? And there's actually already a lot of these temperature sensors out in the state. At our family, we already have over 50 of them in the woods. So what if we can take this data, run it through a computer program, and then bring in future temperature predictions and temperature models, and be able to put those together and create a time range, hopefully very small, that you can tell when the growing degree days are going to hit 116, and therefore, meaning the trees are going to bud. So what does this matter? Well, this can give maple producers be, be able to be two weeks ahead, three weeks ahead. And this matters because the amount of syrup that you make in a season is really directly correlated with how much money you can make or how much syrup there's going to be in the industry for a year. So if we can be two weeks ahead, we can be able to plan our labor. Are we going to put more labor in the woods? Are we going to have to fix the evaporator more? Are we going to make more syrup so we'll have to buy less syrup? Or are we going to have to sell more and we're going to make more profit and then we can invest in a new tractor? Things like that can be really beneficial for maple producers all across the region. 
But these two things, what do they really matter? Why is maple syrup actually really that great? Why we need to talk about it? So I'd like to frame this in terms of sustainability, which, which has three different pillars, economic, environment, and social. So the economic pillar for maple syrup, right? Maple industry has been built from small businesses up. A lot of maple producers have started with just a few taps in their backyard and have moved up to possibly thousands of taps, maybe 200,000 taps. And in this process, they've been able to stimulate the local economy where they're hiring their neighbors. They're purchasing goods from the local community. They're, they're able to purchase uh, other maple equipment from local people. They're buying and selling syrup from local other maple producers. And it really goes on and on. And it goes on and on because maple trees, maple forests, they go on and on. Right? We've had maple woods around here for thousands and thousands and thousands of years. And this economic cycle will just continue and continue as long as somebody is willing to take hold of that sap and to make it into a beautiful product. Another part of economic is that, that maple syrup prices are set by the producers in the United States. So there, there's a high range of prices actually where you can see a, a gallon of grade A maple syrup from $40 to $75. It's a really big range. But this leads to customers having the choice about which maple syrup they're going to buy and leads all the producers to want to make better syrup, make it more efficiently, and provide a better product. It leads to a great amount of healthy competition for the producers and leads to better products for the consumers. The environmental aspect is something that I really, really enjoy talking about. And this, th this when you walk into the maple woods and you, you have a tree, right? That's all tapping is. It's walking into the woods up to a tree. There's no heavy machinery. There's no big things that you got to drag behind you. It's simply walking up, drilling a small hole in the tree, hooking up uh, a spout of some sort, and then watching the sap flow. At our operation, we have tubing in the woods that's suspended above the ground, that's attached to trees, not with, with nails and drills and screws, but just by small clamps that allow the tree to grow. When we do logging operations in the maple woods, we're using, we're using low impact equipment because producers really know how important those trees are and how important it is to maintain this healthy ecosystem. An ecosystem that we're not telling where it is, but but an ecosystem that if there are maple trees there, that's where we're going to go and make maple syrup. Nature has perfectly designed the system to, to live in a certain location. And we're just going there and taking a small piece of it. But the woods is still there. The trees are still there. They're still filtering that carbon dioxide. They're still filtering the soil and, and cycling carbon and nitrogen. It's really a great process. The next thing about the environment is the personal connection that we can have to the trees. So there's some trees in my maple forest that are 200 years old. And I can look at a tap hole on that tree that my great grandfather drilled. So not only can I connect with that tree, but I can connect with the tree and then think about my great grandfather walking up the same exact way on the same exact ground to where I am currently standing. It is a beautiful connection and keeps me grounded to where I came from to recognize where my family has come in this operation. So the social aspect is another really fun part of, of sustainability. I remember as a kid, I would spend time with my great grandma, who is still alive today. She's 102 years old. And we would go to her house, and there was this box of maple sugar candy. And it wasn't the, the good stuff that they would sell, but it were the pieces that maybe had a little bit of a deformation on it. And I would remember I would walk up to that bin, and oh yeah, that was the place to be. Grab a couple pieces. Mom makes me put one back, but that maple sugar candy, even today when I eat a piece of that, it brings me back to those afternoons spending with great grandma on the maple farm. And this is not a story that, that I just have. I know lots of other family have ex families have experienced a similar thing, where maple is passed down from generation to generation. People love giving maple syrup as a gift. It's just this pure, natural, wholesome product that people feel good about giving to somebody else, and it's meaningful because it's so local. Say, so, yeah, I want to give you this, and I want to pass down this tradition. And we find that when this tradition is passed down, maple just spreads and spreads, and more people are having access to it, and more people are eating maple syrup. So to wrap it all up, I would like to talk about the growth of the industry and where I think we can go. 
So maple syrup is only made in the northeast region of the United States and in Canada. That's just a very small section of the world where maple syrup is actually widely used. But what if we could expand into the country? What if we could expand into the world bringing this product? Talk about economic viability for the northeast of the United States. This product, it's pure, it's natural. It has a higher mineral content than brown sugar and white sugar and especially high fructose corn syrup. High fructose corn syrup is not good for us. It's really just not. So, but what if we can market maple effectively so that we can start using maple instead of high fructose corn syrup and anything that we do? There is so much potential there. Another room for growth is, is in, the, in the environment. Right, so if we can continue to, to use trees effectively, if we can continue to cut trees and to manage our forests sustainably. Actually, when, when, there was a study that I read about once that was really exciting that said when you can manage your woods and when you have a young forest that's growing and regenerating, it actually sequesters more carbon dioxide than an old forest does. So if we can continue to do that, we can have an impact on our local climates. We can take in more carbon dioxide and really start to improve our world. So I think that with these new technologies, with, with flying over the trees with, with our drones or our helicopters, with looking at the woods and thinking how can we localize and monitor and how can we look at the temperatures and think about how these different things can change, we can do that. We can make more maple syrup. We can make it more efficiently. We can make it better. And that's all for you. That's because we want to deliver a beautiful product that can bring people together across generations. Something, something that, is, that is great to eat, that is delicious, and that can be used in so many ways. That's why I do what I do. That's why I love talking about this. I love going out in the environment and working with the trees and working with this beautiful product so we can bring it for you. But through all of this, this is the one thing we can't forget today. Through all of this, we have to remember what we have learned from our great-grandparents. And because my great-great-grandfather had the opportunity to move into western New York and to start a farm and to start making maple syrup is why I can stand here today and tell you about this crazy new idea for talking about localized monitoring. And because of that, I can connect with my great-grandfather. I can connect to the trees, and that helps me understand the experiences of others and how where I'm at is very, very fortunate. It's a very great place to be, that I can, that I can work with the woods. And that is how we can continue together to go back to our roots, to understand where we came from, to understand where we are today. And with that, I thank you, and stay sweet. <laughs>